there are types of problems that classical computing will not be able to solve in a reasonable time. Quantum computing represents a fundamental shift because it harnesses the properties of quantum mechanics and gives us the best chance of understanding the natural world. The uh, tantalizing promise of quantum computers is that they can do certain tasks exponentially faster than classical machines. And the quantum supremacy experiment is proof that this is indeed the case. The word quantum computer is a little bit misleading because it sounds like a computer. And when people think of computer, they think of a phone or a laptop. The truth is the phone and the laptop and even a very powerful supercomputer all operate according to the same fundamental rules. And a quantum computer is fundamentally different. The classical bit stores information as a zero or one. And a quantum bit can be both zero and one at the same time. If you have two quantum bits, then there are four possible states that you can put in superposition. With three qubits, it's eight, four qubits, it's 16, but grows exponentially. The nice thing about quantum supremacy is that this is a very well-defined engineering milestone. In a nutshell, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that experimental quantum computers can surpass the best supercomputers in the world. To actually demonstrate quantum supremacy, we have these three steps. First, pick a circuit. Second, run it on the quantum computer. Third, simulate what the quantum computer is doing on a classical computer. We gradually increase the complexity of that circuit. At some point, it becomes completely impossible for the classical computer to keep up. Then we say we've achieved quantum supremacy. We started building together the quantum chips to do this experiment. And then the evolution of the devices were more and more qubits and more and more complexity. It's very much an iterative process. A lot of the work that we put in was not just these chips, but is also the infrastructure that you need to drive those chips. The cryostats that we install them in, all of the control electronics, software, all of this stuff is needed, and it all has to be developed. When the experiment started, we were getting data from the experimentalists. We saw initially a beautiful straight line corresponding to our predictions. Then right before we hit supremacy, they, it dropped much faster and it fell below the threshold where it needed to be. And there's nothing we can do because we don't know how to analyze past that. So everyone's like, oh, we're screwed because it's just, it's getting really, really bad at large number of qubits. It's like, well, maybe there's some really complex interaction between all the qubits. It turned out that the reason was rather benign. We calibrated a little bit better and then the business problem disappeared. So there wasn't like a, oh, we did it. I think we crossed it. And then it wasn't clear that we crossed it, so we crossed it a little bit further. It took me like a day to realize, like, hold on, you know, this is actually experimental data. <laughs> it's kind of amazing to see, you know, how well the theory works. The, the processor that achieved the quantum supremacy is called the Sycamore processor and it's parallel processing two to the 53 states, which is 10 million billion. And thus that enormous amount of parallel processing is what gives it the power. When we run a small chunks of the computation in the largest supercomputer in the world, our estimate is that it will take thousands of years to complete the full computation. Technologies are born this way. Let's say the space age started with a satellite orbiting Earth and it was not doing much, it was just beeping. The big technical achievement of quantum supremacy was really dependent on all this young talent who's kind of taken this and gotten it to work at a very technologically capable level. We have reached a new computational capability. There are certain computations, the only place in the world where you can compute those things is here in our data center at Google Santa Barbara. For the first time, we're showing that we can solve a problem that is just infeasible to do on the biggest computers ever made by civilization. And what's exciting is now we're ready to turn this over to the world and say, let's figure out what we can do with this. The thing that excites me most is building a useful quantum computer. When we can give a researcher a tool that is unlike any other and say, great, figure out something cool to do with it, mankind is pretty good at that.
our compute infrastructure is how we drive and sustain these advances. And tensor processing units are a big part of that. Today, I'm excited to announce our next generation, the TPU V4. These are powered by the V4 chip, which is more than twice as fast as the V3 chip. TPUs are connected together into supercomputers called pods. A single V4 pod contains 4,096 V4 chips, and each pod has 10x the interconnect bandwidth per chip at scale compared to any other networking technology. This makes it possible for a TPU V4 pod to deliver more than one exaflop, 10 to the 18 power floating point operations per second of computing power. Think about it this way. If 10 million people were on their laptops right now, then all of those laptops put together would almost match the computing power of one exaflop. This is the fastest system we've ever deployed at Google, and a historic milestone for us. Previously, to get an exaflop, you needed to build a custom supercomputer. But we already have many of these deployed today. And we'll soon have dozens of TPU v4 pods in our data centers, many of which will be operating at or near 90% carbon-free energy. And our TPU v4 pods will be available to our cloud customers later this year. It's tremendously exciting to see the space of innovation. As we look further into the future, there are types of problems that classical computing will not be able to solve in a reasonable time. Quantum computing represents a fundamental shift because it harnesses the properties of quantum mechanics and gives us the best chance of understanding the natural world. Achieving our quantum milestone was a tremendous accomplishment, but we are still at the very beginning of a multi-year journey. One problem we face today is that our physical qubits are very fragile. Even cosmic rays from outer space can destroy quantum information. To solve more complex problems, our next milestone is to create an error-corrected logical qubit. It's simply a collection of physical qubits stable enough to hold quantum information for a long period of time. We start by reducing the error rate of our physical qubits, then combining a thousand physical qubits to create a single logical qubit, and then scaling that up to a thousand logical qubits, at which point we will have created an error-corrected quantum computer. Today, we are focused on enabling scientists and developers to access beyond classical computational resources. But we hope to one day create an error-corrected quantum computer. And success could mean everything from increasing battery efficiency to creating more sustainable energy to improve drug discovery and so much more. The roadmap begins in our new data center, which we are calling the Quantum AI Campus. Let's step inside. Michael, are you there? Hey, Sundar, how's it going? Yeah, I'm here, and I'm excited to learn why I'm here, and I'm guessing that's why he's here. Hey, Michael. Hey. I'm Eric, lead engineer here. I'd like to welcome you to one of the most powerful quantum computing facilities in the world. Oh, thank you, thank you. What's this, can I touch it? Uh, yeah, that's a quantum processor. And inside are these actual physical qubits. Oh, hey, little guy. Qubits are the fundamental building blocks of quantum computing. But they're incredibly fragile. Oh. Even the tiniest particles can disrupt their operation. Right. Which is why we work so hard to create the optimal environment to keep them stable. Right, and I'm guessing the optimal environment doesn't include like Cheeto dust. So I'm just uh, gonna put this no, puppy right it back. Thanks. Let me show you where the clean ones go. Cool. So we built this campus to inspire all of our quantum mechanics and to show the world what the future of computing looks like. Good for you, dude. Look at you, dude. Thanks. That's a cool lamp. Uh, it's not a lamp. This is actually a cryostat, and you're looking at the inside of a quantum computer. Wow, cryostat, I love that word, cryostat. I'm guessing people want to know, what makes a cryostat a cryostat? Eric? Well, everything you see here, from the wiring to the aluminum, copper, and gold metal stages, have been chosen to create a cold and quiet environment for our quantum processors to operate. Right, 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 and in English? Uh, it's a fridge for our qubits. Right, right, and how cold are we talking about? Uh, we approach near absolute zero, hmm. 10 millikelvin to be precise. Wow. Which means that parts of our lab are some of the coldest places in the universe. Wow, colder than Canada? Yeah, colder than Canada. 
Well, it's not just temperature that's important. In fact, we want to remove all distractions from our keyboard. Right. Including unwanted electrical and magnetic signals. Yeah, yeah. Who wants that, right? Well, let me show you what the final product looks like. Is this a cryostat? No, that's not a cryostat. What about this? Is this a cryostat? That's not a cryostat. No? This is a cryostat. Nice. In fact, this is a fully assembled quantum computer. Yeah? So where's the keyboard? Well, there's no keyboard, but it contains everything you've just seen inside and custom control electronics, all of which were designed and built by our team here at Google. Wait, 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 wait. Is this a Bob Ross? Is he on the team? Tell me he's on the team. He's not on the team. OK. But, but this mural is our homage to Mother Nature. See, quantum is the language of nature, and we're learning to speak it here. It will enable us to run precise simulations of the natural world, unlocking answers that would otherwise remain unknown. OK, so let me see if I get this right. OK, so these qubits are really smart, right? But they're really picky about their work environments. So you got to put them in a lamp, right? But even then, they're like, no, I don't want anybody eating any Cheetos around me. And they're like, I'm sorry, OK, I didn't know, right? So then you've got to wrap them in you know, like this Bob Ross blanket of love, right? And then you keep them there until they can tell us how to think like the Earth. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Okay, you know what this is? This is the power button, and I want to well, start it. I, I, we're not quite there yet. I'm glad you're on board. Okay. Today, we've reached the first milestone, beyond classical computational capabilities. This is us. Yeah, we're here. Everything you've seen here today is what we're using to build to our next milestone, an error-corrected logic computer. Right. And from there, Tile thousands of those together to reach our ultimate goal of error corrected quantum, quantum computer. computer. Right, that's my goal too. Well, you're in luck. We're building a team to assemble all the right ingredients, all right here at the Quantum AI campus that you just helped us with. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you know what? Thank you, and thank you for everyone uh, that's joining us. Uh, I want to leave you with a couple of my favorite words that I just learned. Uh, one of them being qubits, cute qubits, uh, cryostat, right, and melon chilies. Sundar, it was a pleasure doing science with you.